Hi, this is Mark Wright, pastor of Mandeville Christian Church. America needs God. Now more than ever. Now, we've always needed him. All, even in good times, we've needed him. But in these hard times, we need God. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And we're going to look at a very familiar verse, verse 14. And in that verse, there's a pr phrase, a promise at the end of the verse, where God says, I will heal their land. I will heal their land. America needs that today. We need God to heal our land today. We need God's healing in regard to this pandemic. We need healing for our physical bodies. We need God's healing in regard to our economy. There is great fear today that our economy could not only be going into a recession, but much worse, we could be going into uh, a depression. We need God's healing today in regard to our families. These stay-at-home orders have put pressure on the family, uh, and sadly, many will turn to alcohol, many will turn uh, to domestic violence, there will there'll be, the divorce rate may go up. We need God's healing on families, and we need God's healing on our moral and spiritual climate. We need God's healing on our spiritual lives. So turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter Seven, And I want to point out something. When you read the context of this verse, just the verse before it, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13. Uh, usually we quote verse 14. We don't often look at verse 13. But 13 says something very important that we ought to take notice of. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13, God's talking. And this is at the dedication of the Temple of Solomon. God is talking and God says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. Now God is talking. God says, when I do these things. So what God is saying is that he disciplines his people. And yes, God sometimes sends disaster to punish the disobedient. Now we know from the passages we saw last week that God does this not to hurt us. He does this, does this to restore us. He does this to help us. Uh, sometimes trials bring us closer to God. And sometimes God himself sends the trial. Now, this does not mean that COVID-19 was sent by God as a punishment. It doesn't mean that. It could be the case. It's possible because we see in the Bible many cases where God sent plagues to punish the wicked, to punish the disobedient, and to discipline his own people. It is possible, but we don't know that because God did not give us that revelation. God did not give us that word. Um, that verse says, no one has known the mind of the Lord. That's a very important verse. In this passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, we read of four things that God wants his people to do in difficult times, in hard times, and always, always, but especially in difficult times when there are plagues when there uh, are other natural disasters, there's four things that God wants us to do. And they are, God wants you to humble yourself. God wants you to pray. God wants you to seek his face. And God wants you to turn from your wicked ways. Now I'm going to read this verse, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We need that today. We need God to hear our prayers. We need uh, God to forgive our sin. We need God to heal our land. We need physical healing. We need economic healing. We need healing for our families. And we need healing for our spiritual condition. Okay, four things. Number one, humble yourself. That's what God wants you to do. This is what God wants you to do in a time of crisis. He wants you to humble yourself. 
Now, humbling yourself is important for all relationships, your relationship with God and your relationship with your significant others. You must humble yourself. You see, the opposite of humility is a defiant, destructive arrogance. And it's destructive because it does harm to relationships. Arrogance does harm to relationships. Humility, true humility, is healthy for relationships. Now, there's a false humility that is, is wrong, and it's not what we're talking about. That's not a biblical humility. A false humility is when you only see your failures and your sins and, and your faults, and you don't take into consideration your good, your positive traits, and, and your, your value. And this false humility could lead to depression and even suicide. That's not what we're talking about here. That's really a blindness. That's a dishonesty. False humility is not honest because you're only taking into consideration your worst traits and you're not taking into consideration your, your good traits. But the opposite is also harmful, and that is defiant arrogance. Defiant arrogance is when you're blind to your faults. You're blind to your sin. You're blind uh, to your negative traits, and you only see your good traits, and you think you're self-sufficient, you think you're indestructible, you, you think you're invincible, you think you're better than everybody else. See, that is a destructive arrogance. So the humility that we're talking about here is, is simple honesty. It is an honest assessment of who you are, where you take into consideration your good traits and your negative traits. And by taking into consideration your negative traits, you realize that you have failed and that you are imperfect and you are flawed. And just because, because you are flawed, you are more gentle and kind to others around you, your significant others, your husband, your wife, your children, your, because when they are flawed, because you're flawed too, they need forgiveness and you need forgiveness. And when you realize that you need forgiveness just as much as they need forgiveness, that's humility. And that's healthy for relationships. Uh, arrogance says, I don't need you. I'm self-sufficient. I don't need anyone. And I'm willing to hurt you and abuse you because I put my own pride above the relationship. But true biblical humility says, I love you and I need you. And I am willing to sacrifice at times when needed to help you and to help our relationship. God wants you to have humility. Now, it's important to have humility for the land, for, to receive this promise of God healing our land. Because what God wants us to do is to humble ourselves and recognize our sins and to confess our sins and repent of our sins. And you cannot... Recognize your sin if you're filled with prideful arrogance and you're blind to your own, your own failures. God wants you to have true humility, biblical humility. He wants you to examine yourself and recognize your sins, recognize your failures, recognize your imperfections. And this will lead the way to prayer. It will lead the way to seeking his face. It will lead the way to turning from your wicked ways. So number one, you need to humble yourself. God's people need to humble themselves. That's what God wants. Okay, number two, prayer. Prayer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. That's number two, prayer. Prayer. I'm going to ask you a question. How would you rate your prayer life? Uh, using the, the grading scale of A, B, C, D, F, how would you rate your prayer life? Now, we give Jesus an A+, plus because he prayed constantly. He would pray all night. He would leave the crowds and go off by himself and pray. Prayer was very important to Jesus. And we find cases in, in, the, in the Gospels where he prayed through the night. He prayed for hours. Daniel also would get a high grade for prayer because he, it says in, in the book of Daniel chapter 6, that Daniel would get on his knees three times a day and pray. So he'd probably give Daniel an A. Now on the other uh, side, the, the scale, uh, prayerlessness, when there's, you don't spend any time in prayer, that would be an F. So how would you grade yourself? How would you rate your own prayer life? I want to give you three suggestions uh, to having a better, more healthy prayer life, because this is what God wants. God wants us to humble ourselves, and God wants us to pray. Number one, set a time during your busy schedule. Set a time, a specific time for prayer. Now, I know that our schedules have been turned upside down with this stay-at-home order, and it's changed everything. But try and set a specific time every day when you pray. That's number one. Uh, make it an important part of your schedule. Make it a priority, number one. Often when we don't schedule things, it doesn't get done. And often we have to make sacrifices to get things done that are important. 
Number two, have a prayer list. When you go to God in prayer, be a little prepared. Go to God with preparation. Have a prayer list and pray over that list. And number three, posture is important. Posture is important. Now, again, in the book of Daniel, it says he kneeled three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed three times a day. I do believe posture is important. Now, you can pray in any position. You can pray standing up doing the dishes. You can pray sitting down in your car driving. Uh, just don't close your eyes. You can pray uh, mowing the lawn. Uh, you can pray in any physical posture. But I do believe that posture is important, and there needs to be some time when I believe we get down on our knees and pray to God. I think that posture is important. In the military, posture is important. When an officer walks in the room, th those who are uh, below his rank stand at attention because posture is important. And when you come into the presence of God, we're always in the presence of God. He said, I'll never leave you, but prayer does draw us closer. And when you seek to draw close to God, posture is important. Posture is important. So set aside a specific time for prayer. Have a prayer list. Posture is important. And number four, spend some time just in silence before God, in, in silent prayer, allowing God to convict your heart. Because that's what this passage is about. This passage is about humbling yourself before God and, and examining yourself in his presence and allowing the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. And sometimes we're blind to our own faults. We're blind to our own sin. So spend some time before God in silence, in quietness, in silence, allowing him to touch our hearts, allowing him to convict our hearts. It's amazing how close we can draw near to God when we do that. So we need God's healing on our, our land. And there's four things he asks us to do. Number one, humble yourself. Number two, spend time in prayer. Pray. And number three, seek his face. Let me read the verse again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now we need God's healing on our land. We need God's healing uh, in regard to our our finances, our economy. We need God's healing in regard to our physical health, our physical bodies. We need God's deliverance from this pandemic. We need God's healing in regard to our families, that families will stay together and have harmony and love in their homes. And we need God's healing in regard to our spiritual condition. And here it says we should seek his face. Now the word face is very important. Of course, we can't see God. God is invisible, and, and that's revealed throughout Scripture. No man has seen God. But when it refers to face, it's referring to a close, personal relationship. That's what it's referring to. Now, now we understand this on a human level. On a human level, face-to-face -face communication in, in, a, in a relationship is very, very important. Too often, we're glued to our phones. We're glued to the Internet. We're glued uh, to, to video games. We're glued to downstreaming movies. We're glued to TV. And too often, we, we lack a face-to-face -face communication with our significant others. And therefore, our relationships suffer. And our relationships become shallow. And our relationships become weak because we don't have face-to-face -face communication as often as we should way too often in our relationships now, face-to-face -face communication means you look someone in the eyes and you talk and you talk about meaningful things. It may be a light subject. It may be a heavy subject. But you look at a loved one in the eyes and you look at their facial expressions and you interact. That's the way people used to do all the time before all of this technology. And I believe sometimes technology, as good as it has been in many, many ways, has also hurt us because we've lost personal relationship skills. Face-to-face -face communication is so important. And what this verse says, seek his face, it's talking about having a close personal relationship with God. Be intentional. Be intentional about seeking God. Be fervent when it comes to seeking God. Make it a priority. God wants this to be important for you to seek him. God doesn't want you to be some disinterested party that's aloof and distant. God does not want you to be distant. God wants you to seek him. And this is one of the problems of organized religion and formal uh, religion. You can go through all of the motions and never seek God. You can go through all of the motions of organized religion and never be close to God. You can go all through all of the religious activities 
and not seek God. God wants you to seek him. We saw a verse last week in Jeremiah 29 that says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Seek him with all your heart. Seek his face. The word face implies a personal, intimate relationship with God. That's what God wants with you. And that's what you should seek fervently, intentionally, willfully. Seek God. Okay, four things. Four things. In order to experience healing for our land, God's people, the church. We're not talking about all of society. We're just talking about God's church. God's church must do four things. Number one, humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves. You must humble yourself. Number two, pray. How's your prayer life? How would you write your prayer life? Number three, seek his face. Seek a personal, intimate relationship with God and be fervent about it. Place priority upon it. Make that important to you, to your own heart, your own life. And number four, turn. Turn from your wicked ways. I'm going to read the verse one more time. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I remember years ago when I lived in Mexico and we were driving from uh, Puebla, Mexico, about 700 miles north to Saltillo, Mexico. And we were out in the desert of San Luis Potosí on the highway and it was time for a gas stop. And uh, there wasn't much out there in this part of uh, Mexico. It was a, a barren desert type environment, uh, not a lot of towns, not a lot of landmarks. And we stopped to get gas. And after filling up with gas, I, I turned back on the, high road, on the highway and I went the wrong direction. Now, my wife will tell you I'm not always good at reading signs. My mind is often somewhere else. Uh, maybe deep thoughts, who knows, but my mind is somewhere else. I sometimes miss signs. I will say there, there weren't a lot of signs out there. Uh, but whatever sign was or wasn't there, I missed it. And I went the wrong direction. And not only was I not paying attention, but my wife and the other passengers in the car were not paying attention. About an hour later, I realized we were going the wrong direction. Uh, we drove, you know, probably 70 miles the wrong direction. I finally saw a landmark, a sign that clued me in. I'm going the wrong direction. I made a wrong turn. I went over an hour in the, the, the wrong direction. And so I had to turn around. This verse says turn. It uses the word turn. When I realized I was going the wrong direction, I had to turn. I had to turn around. I had to do a U-turn and start going the correct direction again. And I think many times in life we're going the wrong direction. We're doing something that's displeasing to God. We've got involved in some activity or some relationship or some, some enterprise that's not pleasing to God and we need to fix it. We need to turn. We need to turn now, let's just look at America here for a minute. Does America need repentance? Does America need to return from its evil ways? Let's talk about pedophilia for a minute. Now, it's long been known that there's been cases in Hollywood like Roman Polanski and more recently Harvey Weinstein and Epstein and others who've committed uh, pedophilia. But sadly, there's been documented cases of the in the church, hundreds of documented cases where an organized religion, the crime of pedophilia, the heinous loathsome act of pedophilia has been committed preying upon children. America needs to turn from its evil ways. Now, what about sex trafficking? When children are kidnapped and sold and then uh, people pay to have sex with children, America needs to turn from its evil ways. What about the crime rate, the murder rate in cities like Chicago, St. Louis, and New Orleans? Uh, stupid crime. Often it's cartel crime. Often it's gang crime. But it's, it's often stupid crime killing people that are innocent bystanders and have nothing to do with the, 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 the quarrel. America needs to turn from its evil ways. What about white collar crime? We can point our finger at the bank robber that walks into a bank with a gun, but the white collar crime, those thieves often steal far, far, far more. Thieves like Bernie Madoff that st st stole billions and billions of dollars. They steal more, and that's greed. That's the love of money. America needs to turn from its evil ways. And we could go on and on and on. What about the 60 million unborn babies that were put to death in, in our abortion clinics. Now, Hitler killed six million, six million people in his death camps. In our abortion clinics, 
abortion has stopped the beating heart of approximately 60 million unborn babies. That's a fact. That's a fact. America needs to turn from its evil ways. And we could go on and on and on. America needs to turn from its evil ways. Four things. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek God's face. And turn from your evil ways. And when you do this, God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins. And I will heal your land. We need God's healing today on America.